I've got a whole process I teach my clients about when they write a blog post, how they can then share it for eternity. And that's something I'll do myself as well. I love that. Share it for eternity. <laughs> Power to Live More with Joe Dodds. Welcome to the Power to Live More podcast, all about productivity, organisation, well-being, energy and resilience. I'm Jo Dodds and I started this show to enable interesting people to share their stories about how they use their power to live more and by that I mean to do the stuff that they want to do more than the stuff that they need to or should do. It's about creating a life for yourself where you have the energy, health and space to be happy and fulfilled, spending your time as you'd like, whether that be at work, home or somewhere else entirely. That's your choice. Hello. My name is Ellie Dodds and I'm co-presenter and today Joe is interviewing Karen Williams of Librotas. Joe and Karen have been connected online for many years having met originally at an event run by a very well-known marketing guru. Karen Williams is the book mentor of Librotas. She works with coaches, therapists, consultants and other business experts who want to write and publish a non-fiction book that grows their business, raises their credibility and attracts higher paying clients. She helps them to overcome their fears, have the courage to share their wisdom and ultimately enables them to change lives through their writing. Karen is the best-selling author of Book Marketing Made Simple, Their Mouse That Roars, Your Book Is The Hook, How To Stand Out In Your Business and The Secret Of Successful Coaches. Back to the studio. Today I'm interviewing Karen Williams, the book mentor from Libertas. I don't think I even said that right after practicing so hard. (laughs) So hi Karen, thanks for joining me. (laughs) Absolutely perfect Jo, thanks for inviting me and yeah, perfect introduction. (laughs) (laughs) Lovely. So tell us about you, what you do and where you do it. Thanks for your intro, Joe. Um, I'm Karen Williams. I am the book mentor from Libertas. And a lot of people say, what does a book mentor do? Um, I basically work with business owners who want to write a book. So they can be coaches, um, consultants, trainers, therapists, and they've got this dream to get their um, system, their process, their um, ideas, their memoir out on paper. And I help them through the whole process. So all of the steps really from planning, writing, publishing and marketing. So in a nutshell, that's what I do. Lovely. And how do you do that with them? From from where? Are you face to face? Are you online? How does it work? Um, I'm based in Portsmouth in the UK, south of the UK, and I work with people all over the world. Um, generally, I like to do a day with people. So people who are working one to one with me, um, we tend to start with the planning day. So, um, you know, I'm quite happy to travel to do that or people meet me in London or something like like that. But most of the stuff I do from my home office um, uh, yeah, mm-hmm. working remotely with people. So a day like today, I've had clients all day from um, the Isle of Wight to um, Surrey to, um, you know, all over. Yeah. Um, really depends on the client. <laughs> Lovely. And so where you actually do that, so you're at home, do you have a separate office? Do you work in a particular room? Do you move around? How does that all work? I've got a separate office. Cool. Lovely. And is it all very set up? <laughs> Is it one of the ones exactly, that you yeah. and share it with people because it's that good? <laughs> oh, I don't know about that, but it's, it's all set up, but it's all, um, I don't know, I'll, I'll necessarily take a picture of it. But yeah, we um, we moved into our house 20 years ago. And uh, one of the things I did when I started out in business is to get an office set up. You know, when I started out 11 years ago, um, I literally did work from my um, dining room table which is not ideal when you're working with clients but now I can shut the door I can get on with things um and it's yeah really great setup in here mm, yeah lovely I have my own office and uh, didn't to begin with either well in fact I did it, but it was upstairs so when I used to have a, a a business where people could actually come around I used to be saying would you like to come up to my office you know like looking like I was taking them up to my bedroom <laughs> <laughs> so we we had an office uh, made on the ground floor so I didn't quite have to do that but nobody comes here anymore so it doesn't really matter where it is but uh, it is nice. Well I'm probably it? I'm probably a bit like you and um, these days if I meet clients face to face I tend to meet them in a hotel a meeting room that type of thing mm-hmm. so you know that enables me to get out and about rather than just sit here all day yeah. rather than people come you know to my home office so um, yeah. Yeah. But I think it's really what works for you I find that it's just really convenient to just be able to walk 10 steps into the office rather than um, you know have to go out and about.
about in the morning traffic to um, commute to a, an office that you pay for. Mm, yeah, exactly. So tell us a bit about the morning then. Does, does it uh, have a particular uh, format to it? Have you got a routine or is it just uh, get, to the, get to the office in the 10 steps and then decide from there? <laughs> I suppose it depends on the day. I'm more of a daily sort of like a weekly routine rather than a morning routine person. But if I'm um, in the office, I tend to start with hot water and lemon. It just tends to be how I like to ease myself into the day. I like to ease myself in gradually. And, you know, I've got colleagues who like to start working really early. I don't. I'm, I'm not a night owl. I'm not an early bird. I'm kind of somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. um, three days a week, I go to the gym in the morning, sort of, you know, normally get there at about eight o'clock and then start work at 10. So as I said, it's very rare I do um, client calls early. It's more about sort of like 10 to 6 tends to work for me. You know, sometimes you might find me in my dressing gown answering emails. You know, it really depends. <laughs> <laughs> but email's fine. They can't see you. <laughs> no, exactly. I have had moments where suddenly, oh, I've got a client call soon. I'd better go and get dressed. <laughs> <laughs> do you ever have but the pyjamas think... on underneath and the, and the posh stuff on top? <laughs> no, no, I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you never know when you might have an unexpected Skype call is all I'm going to say. So um, always be presentable when you've got client calls or when you're likely to speak to clients. Yeah. Um, you know, really from a boundary point of view, for me, it's more about setting boundaries for time. I like to do, you know, specific things or specific days. So that for me works well, especially when it comes to things like writing a book, because, uh, you know, some people like to do like, you know, hour in the morning writing. That doesn't work for me. It doesn't work for most of my clients. For me, it's about having big chunks of time. So. Um, I tend to do admin on a Monday, so I set up my social media, that type of thing, um, emails, um, sort of mailing, uh, sort of newsletter li um, emails, that type of thing. Mm. Tuesday to Thursday tends to be client time. So like a day like today, I have had, I've spoken to three clients, I've got one more to go later on. Um, it's a Thursday, so um, that's why. And then I tend to where possible have creative time on a Friday but mm. also I'm quite flexible over that you know sometimes I work at weekends sometimes I work in the evening it really depends on but as long as I do have that time blocked out for doing all of the things in in my life and my business it works best for me yes yeah yeah I use um theme days and I've just reviewed them again as it's uh, we're recording this as it's sort of back to school time although it won't be going out until a bit later on but um I um I've swapped them around because I realised actually they weren't working. You know they were sort of titles for the days, but I never actually did the things on the days that I <laughs> imagined I was going to. So I've had to review them and actually use them properly. <laughs> well, I think it does depend on um sometimes going with the needs of the client. I have one client who likes to have a call with me on a Friday, and that's okay as long as I give myself other time to do the creative stuff. So mm -hmm. I think for me it's about being flexible, having you know your you know, I do prefer at least Monday morning to sort of, um, you know, focus on what, you know, what what's coming up for the week. What do I need to do? Where am I going? Yeah. Who am I with? To actually have that planning time rather than jumping straight into a client call. Yeah, it's interesting. You mentioned boundaries earlier, and I was um, thinking about that only yesterday, where a client where I have to go to them was asking me about running some focus groups for them and what dates did I have available. And I started writing the list, and I added Mondays and Fridays into the list, even though Monday is my office day and Fridays I don't like. To to be anywhere else and uh, it was really funny because I wrote all the dates out and then I thought nope take the Mondays and Fridays off <laughs> <laughs> because you know I'd forgotten about you know my boundaries yeah. um, and yeah. you know they only needed two days and I had about six options for them without using up the Mondays and Fridays and I thought well actually you know set up my stall as I want it to yeah. be and actually just give them the dates that I want to do not the ones that I'm trying to be flexible with sort of thing so it was a, a reminder about how important boundaries are. Yeah, and I was talking to a client earlier today and she was talking about her book and she's struggling to find time to write it. And um, so we were looking at how she can fit that time into her diary when she's not doing client work. She's not on call. She's not answering email. She's not answering the phone. And I think it's also important to put in boundaries in, in that respect, especially if you're doing a project like writing a book, creating a course, product, program or whatever it is. You need you need that, you know, that focus time where you're not distracted by other things. Otherwise, it will take twice as long, three times as long to do it. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And then what about at the end of the day? Do you because you've got an office, do you sort of shut the door and that's it. Or you did sort of talk about being a bit more flexible earlier. Is there a sort of end of day routine? Um, I can be a bit of a workaholic, to be honest. and I don't always switch off at the end of the day. Um, I think when you've got technology like iPhones, iPads, things like that, you know, you can leave them in the office, but invariably you want to look at something later. And it's so easy to check emails and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but on a personal basis, what I tend to do is generally work one evening a week. So sometimes I have clients who are working or they've got other things going on. Um, 
or uh, you know sometimes I'm I've got a husband I don't have any children sometimes he's out and I might work that evening so for me it's about the flexibility you know mm -hmm. I came in to do what I do because I want the flexibility to work when I want to work so I think I think I think of nothing of having you know my hair cut on a Monday morning or you know a Thursday afternoon or something like that and then I might work late you know one yeah. you know, or even over the weekend so I think for me it's about the flexibility mm -hmm. and building it into the life I want to lead as much as anything else absolutely I think so many people come out of corporate into their own business and sort of feel they have to do nine to five or sort of 24 yeah. 7 when you're first setting up and and it's quite difficult isn't it when you're not used to it to to be a bit like you said I and mean, I'm the same my my life is I was talking about work life integration you know that that mm. you literally just do what you need to do when you need to do it or what you want to do when you want to do it and fit it all in somehow <laughs> Yeah, and, and my husband's working in, you know, a lot of weekends at the moment. So I'm quite happy to do some work at the weekend and then make, maybe take time off with him in the week. So, again, it's just that flexibility is, is key. But it, there's a fine line between working too hard and working and not working enough as well. And I think when you work from home, it can be quite hard to find that the, the balance. I'm pretty much there most of the time. Mm. Um, and I think it's also about, you know, knowing when you're going to be busy. Um, I've just come back from holiday and... Um, I run a writing retreat each year and I've only got two weeks where I'm in the office and I know in that two weeks I probably will be working you know quite a lot but you know there's trade-offs sometimes when you when you're um, you know doing things like holidays retreats and then I've got another holiday as well so it's just about having that balance. Mm, yeah so what about actually getting the work done how do you make sure that happens so you've talked about some of the tasks that you have how do you manage that? I'm quite good at managing things. I am a completer finisher, which is one of the reasons why a lot of clients come to me because I'm good at structure, I'm good at planning, I'm good at seeing things from a different point of view. Um, and the way I've worked has changed as well. I used to have like a master to-do list where I'd had everything I need to do on a piece of paper, but obviously that can be quite overwhelming. And then I used to transfer that onto a post-it note of the things I was going to achieve each day. Um, but a few months ago, I moved on to um, having a CRM system, which has been, oh God, I haven't looked back to be perfectly honest, Jo. Um, I use a system which helps me to manage tasks it helps me to manage leads and prospects um, it helps my VA and I to keep on top of you know what's going on I can set her tasks as well which is really great <laughs> yeah, that was a good um, but you know for me it's just having knowing what I'm doing every day and also being realistic yeah. because you know a day when I like today when I've had quite a lot of client calls um, there's a lot of things on my to-do list which I'm rescheduling which is fine but they're on there and because I can literally drag and drop it makes it really easy to say right I've got time next Tuesday, I'm going to do it then. It's not realistic to fit it in um, among client work today. So mm. that's how I tend to keep on top of things. And what's the CRM that you're using? I use one called um, Less Annoying. Oh, not heard of that one. <laughs> Less Annoying <laughs> yeah. CRM. Actually, uh, yeah, if anyone's interested, um, have a look. They do, they do a free trial, um, which I signed up for, um, and I found it really useful. Of course, you know, there's always going to be things that – you know, don't work 100% right, like it doesn't sync with some of the other systems I use, which is just a tiny bit annoying. <laughs> um, but generally, I find it's a really useful system. Yeah, yeah. I, I like the idea of integrating the, 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 the customers, the clients and the tasks as well. I'd, I'd certainly used to use one from um, my business that, that was similar. I mean, I've, I've, I've stopped using it now because I, I can manage things in a different way. And then I've got project management tools separately to that. But being able to, I used to be able to set up, I don't know, uh, a, a process where, where when I tag a, a prospect with X, all these things yes. happened and all these tasks appeared. Is that the sort of thing that you're doing with yours? Uh, sort of. Um, if, say, for example, I've got something to send to a client, I will tag and tag them through the system, but I can also just set up daily tasks like a to-do list as well, not tag to anything. So mm. that's what I like about it, the option that you can tag it and it reminds you to I don't know, follow up with somebody yeah. um, and you can tag it to a particular a prospect lead or client. Um, but generally, you can also just set tasks that need to be done. Yes, yeah, yeah, excellent. You'd like a to-do list online, and then obviously you've got the option of other people. You can let other people see your to-do list, like um, Tracy, my VA. You know, she can go in there and see what's going on as well. Mm -hmm. So I know you're a bit of a tool and app fan. So what what have you got to share with us today? <laughs> Well, I think, you know, there's a couple of things. I think that nothing beats a good old um, packet of post-it notes when you're planning something. <laughs> I, did, um, so. I did spot that when you mentioned it earlier. I thought, yeah, good old post-it notes. <laughs> yeah, when I work with a client to plan out their book, we get the post-it notes out of the paper. We do it all manually. And I think there's just something about seeing, moving things around, being able to see things visually. Mm. Um, 
from you know a, a, an app and a sort of tool point of view yeah less annoying that comes on you know on the list it's a really great way of managing sort of tasks and time that type of thing um one that you've probably had other people recommend is evernote yeah um which is a really great thing so if i'm suddenly inspired in the evening and i've got my ipad in front of me um you know to, for a blog post or something like that i could just tap in a few things and then put it to one side so it just helps me to you know if I've got ideas, if I'm out and about, it just, or even you know, book ideas and things like that, or um, it just enables you to keep all the information together. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll let you into um, a little secret. I'm an Evernote certified consultant. Ooh. <laughs> I did, did the course in the in uh, I think May or June time, and uh, didn't quite realise quite how onerous it was going to be, but I I did it, and also I got my deadline wrong. I got the deadline. I had it in my head it was four days later than it actually was. So I had to do the last third of it in about six, I don't know, till about three o'clock in the morning. But I did it. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I, think it it's, it's, I think everyone just needs to find their own way of doing it. You know, some people like, um, you know, handwritten stuff. Some people like to type things up. Um, and it's just finding a way of organising things that, that work, yeah. isn't it, really? And that's Evernote, I think, is good because you can sync it. Um, I've got the paid for version so I can sync my iPad, my iPhone, my computer and it makes it so so easy um, yeah. and that's what it's all about so one of the you know I said you know one of the reasons clients come to me is because of the process the structure but it's also about the ease and the systems that you put in place that make things easier as well mm, yeah absolutely. Um, and then of course um, managing social media you know Hootsuite I've been away on holiday I'm going away again shortly and you know something like Hootsuite is a really great way of managing social media because mm. um, you you know even if you're not there in real time you can schedule things you you know I've got a whole process I teach my clients about when they write a blog post how they can then share it for eternity and that's something I'll do myself as well I love that share it for eternity <laughs> well I think it's so easy, isn't it, to write a blog post, publish it once and do nothing with it. Yeah. Whereas you can share it every month, just share it in a different way with a different um, headline, a different, um, you know, uh, you know, sequence of words that, that attract more readers and help you to get it out more widely. Mm, yeah, yeah. So I was going to move on to ask you about <clears throat> what you do. Oh, let's see, my voice is going, told you it would, um, to keep healthy and to relax and so on. But um, before we do that, you've mentioned your... Um, writing retreat so th there's a bit of a connection there so t tell us a bit more about that as you said it's it will have gone by the time this is published but it's an annual thing so um if people are interested they can obviously get in touch but tell us a bit more about what that looks like how that works yeah well um since 2000 and where are we now to, to it's the fourth year so to, since 2014 i've been running a writing retreat in the beautiful andalusian mountains in southwest spain um it came about because i was working with a client i think it must have been about 2013 who um, was living out there at the time she was living out there with her boyfriend who was um, who is spanish um and she said oh I'd you know we, i live in a beautiful location i'd love to run retreats and i went well i would like to um you know put together writing retreats and at the time I was making the transition from business coach to book mentor um, so we put together a retreat that we ran in 2014 and I loved it out there I love it out there it's on the edge of a village in the mountains um, you know beautiful inspiring scenery a lovely location um, and yeah every September now we run a writing retreat out there and it's developed it's grown you know, as time's gone on um, but we have you know somewhere in the region of four to eight people out there who are writing their books um, so yeah it's a fantastic space and I think what I find with many people is they have the bright idea to write a book and then distractions get in the way like um, you know they wake up and the dog needs to be walked the cat needs to be fed the kids need to go to school and when you're out on the writing retreat all you need to do is focus on you yeah. Um, and that's what I love about it. It's fully inclusive. So everything's provided um, so people can just do what they want to do well. And also retreat because it's got a pool. It's got walks. Um, uh, Rebecca, who organizes it for me, she takes us through walks through the mountains. So it's all about recharging and refreshing as well. Is it just very quiet because you're all scribbling away? <laughs> <laughs> oh it doesn't have to be quiet but it's nice that you can be it's informal as well so I've been known to sit in my shorts around the pool and mentor people even be in the pool and mentoring people mm -hmm. because it's the informal things that happen like on the walks over a glass of wine in the evening it's all of those informal um you know nuggets of information that come out when you're not in that formal setting which makes the biggest difference in my view yeah yeah exactly Lovely. So, so tell us a bit about the relaxing health and all that sort of stuff. Do you, do you do particular things? You said you go to the gym. 
Yeah, I go to the gym three or four times a week. I like love walking. Um, and for me, regular breaks are important. And I know when I haven't, you know, I've just been on holiday to Italy um, and I worked pretty solidly. I launched a book. I launched two client books. So there's a lot of things going on. And I knew it was going to be a good sort of five and a half months without a proper break. Um, but then I've got another break coming up soon. So I, I definitely can't complain in that respect. But I think, you know, having regular breaks is important. And I've learned the hard way, you know, not putting it in. Um, obviously, you know, that can have an impact as well. Mm. Um, I have been known to be a workaholic. I do try my best now to keep that balance in my life going. Um, and sleep's important as well, you know, um, you know, I'm not, uh, I like to wake naturally, I prefer not to set an alarm, I tend to wake up between about six and seven o'clock in the morning. Um, so yeah, nutrition and exercise is important, but sometimes it's the first thing to go when you're busy as well. Yes, yeah, exactly. Hmm. I just want to keep it real, I, I don't say I've got a particular routine, I do meditate, just not as much as I probably ought to. <laughs> <laughs> they always say, don't they, if you haven't got time to do 10 minutes of meditation, then you should take longer or something, I can never quite exactly. remember the <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Lovely. So um, what about um, learning more and, and improving? You've obviously transitioned in your business um, in the time that uh, that you've you've had your own business, so I guess that was a, a personal development thing for you as well. What, yeah, you... well, I've always I've always had a coach or mentor um, in business. So you know, even from the early days when I started out to now, part of a mastermind group at the moment, I've got I've got a mentor through that. But I think you know, we you need to be able to step up, and to be able to step up, you need someone else who's that further, that step further than you are. And that for me has been really really important throughout my whole business. Um, reading's obviously important as well. It's a great way of topping up your knowledge, your expertise. But I also find working with clients, you know, because they're an expert in their topic, you know, whether it's, um, you know, fertility, IVF, divorce, um, you know, retirement, whatever they're writing about. I learn so much just by listening and, you know, to my clients, reading their work, um, hearing their stories. You know, that for me is a learning thing all by itself. Yeah. And one thing I've learned, you know, and something that's really important is that is get support in your business. So, you know, from the early days, I've been working with a VA and I outsource quite a lot of stuff as well. I like to know how things work, but I also outsource a lot of things because why? Sh why d I do what I'm an expert in and get other people to do what they're an expert in. So I work with a designer, an editor um, who does sort of proofreading as well. So they do all the sort of the publishing side of things, whereas I, obviously I can do the things that I do well. So I think that's really important is to is to know what your expertise is and then get support to help you in the areas where other people are experts. And was that something that came naturally? Because I think a lot of small business owners, especially starting out on their own with sort of limited funds, come up against lots of reasons why outsourcing seems like a good idea but they're not going to do it yet and then it, it often doesn't happen yeah and I think um, I don't think it has to be expensive to be honest you know when I started working with my VA I think I was doing something like a few hours a month you know it doesn't have to be expensive um, but I think when you start growing you realize you know if you can earn I know x amount um, you know working with clients and doing the thing where you excel but you can pay y which is less obviously employing someone else to do something that's going to help you to grow your business for me that makes sense but there's always there's always that fine line when you're starting out in business and it's knowing when to make the jump when to invest and I think the problem with a lot of small businesses and this is something I did when I started out so I'm certainly not immune to it is that you um you know you don't have a budget for things you come into it because you think it would be um you know relatively easy to set up a business because you're an expert in the area where you're an expert um, but you don't necessarily have that budget in the early days to invest in things that are going to help you to grow it quicker. Mm. And if you don't invest, it takes longer to grow it. Yes, yeah. It's interesting. I had a um, lunch with a, a, a finance person for small business yesterday, and she was talking about uh, the percentage that you should be looking to spend on marketing and the percentage you'd be looking to spend on uh, accountancy and, and so on. And I thought it's quite often, as small business owners, you don't, think about that you know you sort of think oh I need to sell this and I need to therefore I don't know make a, an advert or I need to put something on social media or I need a social media manager or whatever and you tend to then just spend the money without actually thinking in terms of the whole business you know if I was a, a big company and I was budgeting and all that sort of thing I wouldn't be able to spend more than x on marketing and I wouldn't be able to spend more than y on you know the accountants or whatever but we don't tend to do that with our small businesses do we? 
No, not at all. And I think, yeah, it's just about looking at the business as a whole and what what is your goal? What do you want to create? What is your vision? And what do you need to do to get there? And I think, you know, so many people um, try and do too much. So um, when I wrote my first book back in 2009, I interviewed some successful coaches to, um, to, to write it. So people who were really great as coaches, but they're also successful business people as well. And one of the things I wanted to do was find out the secrets to their success. And one thing that um, a couple of people said is, is find three ways of marketing your business and do it well. Whereas I think a lot of people have that scattergun approach and they try and do everything, but not focus on the things that are really going to help to reach their ideal clients. And that's that's another thing that's important, knowing exactly who your ideal clients are, and then it makes it easier to to find them because you know where they hang out, you know what works and what doesn't work. Mm. You know, should you go on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, you know, speaking, write a book, you know, what's the best way of getting in front of them? Mm-hmm. And I think uh, saying having, you know, changed your business, and as I have um, a number of times in the last 12 years, uh, you also, but as you become more experienced and knowledgeable, you start to also think about dropping the stuff, as you said before, that you're either not so good at or you don't want to do and finding either new ways to do it or just not doing it at all. I and mean, I keep having debates with people because obviously um, live video is such a big thing at the moment and I just hate it <laughs> and I just will not do it. And um, I, I sort of occasionally have this little thing of, oh, maybe I should. And then I think, no you know that you should only do the things you want to do and, and the things that you're good at and, and you know, and all that sort of thing. And, and I rein myself back in and I stop feeling guilty that I haven't done it. Um, but you do, you know, you, you start to get more discerning, don't you, the longer you're in business, I think. And also it's about setting up the system. So certainly I probably do th- more than three I probably have more, I do have more than three marketing channels now, but because I've got the system set up, they kind of, um, you know, they're, they're very much linked and very much systemized to allow me to do more. Yeah. Um, but very much like you, Joe, I don't like video. I've done a couple of Facebook lives when I launched um, my latest book, Book Marketing Made Simple. I did Facebook, you know, Facebook lives to promote it, but that's mm. not my thing. Mm. Um, but it's also finding, again, it's finding support. The videos that are on my website that are on YouTube um 80 percent of them have been done professionally mm. um i'm more comfortable doing that rather than you know doing something you know off the off the cuff yeah yeah i'm the i'm the same well i'm a bit like if somebody just filmed me i remember years ago somebody coming around and saying right we're going to talk about twitter and i'm just going to film you and i was like oh okay and that was fine but it's when i'm doing it myself after the 25th take yeah. I don't want to do it anymore. And I think, well, if I have 25 takes, I'm not going to do it live, clearly, because <laughs> I won't be happy with it by 25 times. Uh, but it's interesting. Um, the other thing on that, a mutual um, business friend of ours, Judith Morgan, always talks about um, sell as you buy. And it's interesting because not everyone says that because obviously you aren't your client. So that mm-hmm. may not be the right thing to do. But I do think that you know, I don't like watching video, which is, and I don't like doing, you know, making video. So that's why I decide not to do video, even though, you know, a lot of people say you should, you should do it. Um, and, and in some ways, that means that people are being attracted to me are going to be the ones that probably don't want to watch video anyway, the same as I don't. Yeah. So I think she does yeah. have a point. <laughs> no, I agree with that as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, you talked about reading um, being important to you. Have you have you got any specific books that you'd recommend? All of mine, of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course, yeah. And uh, that's true, actually. You have said about your books. So tell us what, what books you have published yourself. Um, For yourself, I was I mean. joking. But, um, <laughs> no, no, yeah, no. Um, I did intend to ask you that, so I'm glad you did bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I started out writing, I wrote my first book in 2009, learned the hard way how to do it. That was The Secrets of Successful Coaches that came out in 2011. Mm. And I said never again. And then I wrote my second one, How to Stand Out in Your Business in 2012. Um, your book is a hook, which I published um, a few years later. And we did a second edition earlier this year. Uh, the Mouse at Wars, which is my personal story, which I published last year. Um, and then Book Marketing Made Simple, which is my latest uh, one, which was published um a few months ago, uh, yeah, earlier this year. Mm. Excellent. And what did you say the one about your personal story is called? Uh, the Mouse That Roars. The ma- Ah, The Mouse That Roars. Ah, yeah. I like that. Is, uh, I never set out to do it. Um, there's a story behind it, Joe. so I'll share the story. Um, <laughs> back in 2012, I did a project called um, A Year to Live, um, and it was based on um, a book by a guy called Stephen Levine, who sadly passed away now. And he and his wife, they worked with terminally ill cancer patients and they helped them to live 
the best um, last few months, few years of their life. And he suddenly thought one day, you know, why wait until your time is up to live your best life? So he uh, did a project called A Year to Live and wrote a book about it. Um, and then myself and a couple of friends in 2012 just did the project for a year. Um, we all did it very differently. And I asked myself the question, whenever I had to make a decision, and I asked myself, if I had a year to live, what would I do? Um, so I did things that scared me, like I did a parachute jump, I became a firewalk instructor, um, I ran my first conference. Um, gosh, I did all sorts of things that really stretched my comfort zone yeah. um, by asking myself that question whenever I had to make a decision. Oh, I signed up to do a charity trek to um, Machu Picchu as well. So, um, yeah, and that's just one of the things, uh, and that's really where the Mouse at Walls came from. And then it developed to be, you know, I worked with a um, developmental editor, and she said, look, there's more of a story. What's your story? Um, and that is really kind of my story, mainly my entrepreneurial story, mm. but really the highs and the lows of um, going through all of that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I love that question about if I had a year to live. I think I'd probably be less inclined to go and do all of those things. I'd probably just go and do less stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but another, another thing to think about is if you were sort of, you know, imagine, you know, 20, 30 years time, you're, you know, on your, rock, on your rocking chair, you're, you've got your friends and family around you. What would you like to have said you've achieved, you've done, yeah. you've experienced, you know, what, and I think it's easier to regret the things you have done rather than the things you haven't done. Yes. Yeah. I, I was talking to somebody last night who's, um, uh coming up to a big birthday um and she was saying that she's doing a year of one fun thing and one challenge every month for the year which uh yeah, yeah thought re was really interesting although uh, we had then had a discussion with my other friend this morning who was also part of that discussion around um you know what would those challenges be you know what what are those things that I wouldn't normally do and have I done mm. them already and therefore I don't think I've got them or you know because we all have them don't we we just we're in denial aren't we I suppose about them so, so uh, well yeah I've got another example I'm on the eve of my um, I'm in, in my mid-40s now but in the eve of um, my 40th birthday I, I was with a, a couple of friends we'd done a spa day and um, I wrote down uh I started off being 10 things I wanted to do between the age of 40 and 50. Um, I think I wrote down 15 things. I've crossed one off so far, and I'm about to cross another one off in October. So um, <laughs> Better get um, going then. <laughs> yeah, so I better get going. I've got lots of things on there. Some are fun things, some are travel. Um, but one thing I'm doing in October is I'm doing a TEDx talk, which is very exciting but wow. a bit scary. Yeah. So by the time this goes live, you know, you might be able to sort of keep an eye out on, you know, TEDx to um, yeah. see me um, in full flow. Yeah. So how will we find it? Is it do you know, it's a particular area we can look for, can't we? I, I guess you haven't got your yeah, time. Yeah, YouTube on TEDx. Um, yeah. It will be on there as far as I'm aware. Put um, your name on there. Okay, cool. Yeah, we will do that. Or if people go to libertas.com, they sign up for my mailing list. I will, un unless, it, unless it's a complete and utter failure, I'll be sharing it on there. <laughs> Brilliant, lovely. So, uh, any um, any books by other people that you'd like to recommend? <laughs> yeah, um, The Big Leap by um, Gay. I'll say Gay Hendricks. Is that right? The Big yeah. Leap, really, really brilliant film. Um, book even um that's really great um mm. what else oh there's so many good books out there I'm just looking at my bookshelf yeah, um, that's what people always so say many, <laughs> so many great books that I've learned from at the moment I'm, I'm just downloaded a couple of books around doing TED talks today not surprisingly because <laughs> I'm, I'm just in the process of doing my outline yeah. for me it's just about dipping in and out of things when the, when they're relevant I love I love autobiographies I love um sort of business books I also like to immerse myself in a bit of um fiction from time to time as well and actually read something that you know I don't really need to think and I just need to just absorb myself in and enjoy the story yes yeah yeah exactly lovely so um on to the last couple of questions then um the first one is about what about if things don't go right if you have one of those days where it just all goes wrong what do you do how do you deal with that well, it happens doesn't it I think that's part of life is that not everything goes to plan sometimes you have those moments where you want to rant you want to you know sort of get it out of your system but um, for me it's just about that one of the techniques I love to do I find really useful is journaling so um, you know some people get up in the morning they do their morning pages um, so Julia Cameron so that's another book to look up um, I like to go do a bit of journaling before I go to bed so if I've had you know things go wrong 
I like to put the positive on it. You know, what are the things that have gone right? What am I grateful for? So that's one of the routines I do, not every evening, but, you know, before I go to bed, I think it's a really good place to download. Um, and I've known, you know, in the Year to Live project, you know, um, personal story during that year um my dad had cancer and he did say to me one day you know what if i don't have a year to live and he didn't and you know going through something like that he was only 69 when he passed away going through something like that makes you realize how precious life is and not to dwell on the negative stuff mm -hmm. not to dwell on the things that go wrong mm -hmm. because things go wrong and that's just what life's all about but it's also about looking at the positives and what has gone right and how you can have more of that in your life yeah, yeah. It's funny. I, a lot of what I do now stems from, you know, illness and and uh, death in our family and so on. It's funny, isn't it? When when you talk about young people or when you're young and you sort of say, you know, if only you had the wisdom of of being older and all that sort of stuff. You know, that for me is the biggest thing. That if you actually understood what you've just said about, you know, when you're older, realizing that life's too short and you know, you might only have a year to live or, or whatever. If you just understood that when you were 20 or 25 or 30, yeah. it would make such a difference. People would probably just do stuff a lot sooner that yeah. they end up doing when they're 40 or 50 because suddenly it slaps them in the face and it gives them that incentive. Yeah. But you think, oh, if only people could understand that sooner. Yeah, and a lot of the clients I work with, um, they write their books because they've gone through, either they've gone through an experience and they want to help other people who've gone through something similar, or they've got knowledge that are, that's going to help someone who's going mm -hmm. through a difficult experience. And for me, I have, you know, that I have amazing opportunity every day to help facilitate them getting their message out into the world. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's what I love to do. And um, and things do happen for a reason. And the, the downsides, the dark days have the light sides and the, the positives that come out of it as well um mm. which reminds me of a you know call i had with a client earlier who is, is writing about some of the the tough times but also you know what the gifts are of going through those tough times as well yes yeah so on a day when you've ended the day knowing that you've lived more and i will say that's about doing more of the stuff that you want to do and less of the stuff that you feel you should do or you need to do so when you've had that day of living more what what have you done how how how, when you look back on that day how's it how's it been um i try and do that every day to be honest um i do what i love um i run a business that i enjoy doing i work with clients who i love working with um so i do that most of the time and obviously when i'm not working i you know do my best to you know have a good time anyway so again it comes down to the reflection the journaling the you know appreciating and the gratitude as well mm. that part of the year to live project was all about um you know breathing gratitude being in the moment and i've taken that forward since 2012 and embraced many of the things i learned during that year to life you know for, gosh we're five years later now so it's scary mm. but you know I've, I've embraced a lot of the stuff that i did during that year to my day-to-day -day life now and probably yeah. just do it habitually rather than um actually realizing i'm doing it yeah 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 i think the living in the moment piece it, it just it does sound sometimes when i say that it sounds a bit glib but it, it is so true you know if you if you can really appreciate what's happening now rather than worrying about what's happened before and or thinking about or worrying about what's going to happen in the future sort of thing it does make mm. such a difference doesn't it yeah yeah mm. lovely so it's been really lovely talking to you karen and um, how can people find out more about you and connect with you um, well, I'm I'm all over the place. If you go to <laughs> librotas.com, um, L-I-B-R-O-T-A-S.com, um, you can find out more about me. Um, if you want to write a book and you want to know where to start, there's a, a free download, a free work, a workbook that people can sign up for. Um, I'm on Twitter, um, at Libratas. I'm on Facebook, at Libratas as well. You'll find me on LinkedIn instagram although i'm not generally on there a, a huge amount it's not one of my top marketing um, avenues um <laughs> but, but you have yeah a for it. <laughs> yeah not so much of a process for that but i love facebook and that's where you'll find me hanging out more than anywhere else i think and mm. yeah and if there's anything i can do to help anyone who wants to write a book publish a book market it get it out there to more people i'd love to have a chat lovely thank you really appreciate you joining me thanks karen thanks joe all this information is available in the show notes on the website and I've had a change of website URL since the last podcast. So now you need to go to engagementandwellbeing.com forward slash, in this case, 48. So that's engagementandwellbeing.com forward slash 48. 
The website is the place to go if you want to find out how I can help you to improve your productivity, your organisation, well-being, energy and resilience, your power to enable you to live more. So that's to do more of what you want to do. And the change in the website URL is really just a way of amalgamating everything that I do into one uh, place on the internet on uh, so that I just have one website that I need to update. So the focus is on engagement, employee engagement, which I do uh, with corporates and companies that have employees, obviously, and well-being being around the productivity piece that I'm focusing on, uh, which, you know, in these days of digital overwhelm you know really focusing on helping people to be more productive find the time to get more of the stuff they want to do done and reduce that overwhelm and improve their well-being and that's whether that's individual business owners who perhaps work from home or certainly just work on their own or whether that's business leaders within organizations who uh, either work just in the organization as a leader but also maybe are leaders of people within the organization and helping them to manage in a way that enables them to live more and that enables them and their team to have the best well-being that they can. So as I said, all the information from this podcast is available in the show notes and you just need to go to engagementandwellbeing.com forward slash 48. We look forward to speaking to you next time. Use your power to live more. 